Welcome everybody to this comprehensive on sustainable energy policy. This is the first lesson of the course and its objective is to give a brief introduction to the energy markets in Europe, to know the main features that can help us to understand the framework in which energy policies are developed. Also, we will see some key data on, for example, environmental implication of the energy sector. This will show us the background of sustainable policies development and their importance for climate change mitigation. More in detail information on some of the most relevant aspects of the current energy policies in Europe will be delivered in further lessons within this course. Let's start with a, an, an energy policy outline. Two important facts the increasing evidence of climate change and the growing dependence on energy has underlined the European Union's determination to become a low energy economy. It is also the objective that the energy consumed is safe, competitive, locally produced and sustainable. For these reasons, the European Commission defined in 2007 a new review of the energy policy. This energy policy not only aims to ensure that the European Union's energy market functions efficiently, but also promotes the interconnection of energy networks and energy efficiency. It deals with energy sources ranging from fossil fuels through nuclear power to renewables, such as solar, wind, biomass, geothermal, hydroelectric and tidal. Let's see now some key factors that have inspired the direction of new energy policies in Europe. First of all, the world energy demand is on the rising. European energy consumption is expected to level out in the future, but world energy consumption will contribute to grow due to global population growth and economic catching up. Overall, World energy demand may grow by 45% between 2006 and 2030, as you can see in the, in the figure. This, this fact underlines the fact that emerging economies drive and surely will drive global energy markets, as you can see in the diagram. While OECD countries, the countries members of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, demand in 2035 just 30% uh, higher than in 2010, with an uh, important drop in oil and coal contribution, the share of the non-members of this organization energy demand rises from 55% in 2010 to 75% in 2035. Let's remember the country's uh, member of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. It's basically, basically European Union plus United States plus Canada, Japan, Korea, Australia and New Zealand. Those would be the uh, OECD countries. But what is more important is that China accounts for the largest share of the growth in global energy use. You can see in the uh, orange color. With its demand rising 60% by 2035, followed by India, where demand more than double. This underlines the fact that uh, in the future, the emerging economies will drive uh, the global energy market. Another key factor is the external energy dependency. It's a major issue, specifically for the European Union. As an average, the European Union imports more than half of the energy that it consumes, a 53%. As can be seen in the figure, some countries have even higher levels of external dependency. The highest one is Luxembourg with a 97% of external dependency. Well, when talking about uh, external energy dependency, 
Particularly serious is the situation for oil, as you all know. European Union imports almost 90% of oil consumption from the countries that are shown in the left figure. As you can see there, only a share of 14% comes from the member states. In the case of gas, its dependency is quite lower. Uh, nevertheless, it reaches a significant 65% in 2013, slightly decreasing from 66 in 2012. Only the Netherlands and Denmark are net exporters of gas, while in the 16 member states, energy dependency is higher than 90%. Another important uh, factor that uh, underlines the, the, the energy policy is the interconnection of the uh, internal energy market in Europe. In 2009, Russia and Ukraine gas crisis showed the lack of physical interconnection and the poor functioning of the European internal market with several member states facing several energy shortages for several days. Now the European Union aims to fully integrate national energy markets to give consumers and businesses more and better products and services, more competition and more secure supplies to avoid crisis uh, situation like, uh, like this one. As can be seen in the figure, in the map, some countries experimented important rates of missing gas supply, over 65% in some of the countries. As you can see, there are many reasons why energy policy has been a cornerstone of European integration since its very beginning. In general, it aims to ensure secure, safe and sustainable energy supplies to European businesses and households at affordable prices. The three well-known pillars of European energy policy are the ones that are shown in the in the slide. Competitiveness, security of supply and sustainability. The first one, competitiveness, uh, the aim is to improve the efficiency of the European energy grid by means of creating a truly competitive internal energy market. This would be the key uh, of the competitive competitiveness, internal energy market creation. The other one pillar, the sustainability, aims to actively combat climate change by promoting renewable energy sources and energy efficiency. The last one, the security of supply, aims to better coordinate the energy supplies and demand within an international context. Let's see uh, a bit more in detail uh, the three pillars. First of all, security of supply. Previous figures have shown the importance of imports of some fuels. Blackouts in both European Union and United States have highlighted the need to define clear operational standards for transmission networks and for correct maintenance and development of the network. The concept of security of supply encompasses reduction of external dependence, enforcement of transport infrastructure and gas storage facilities, and the diversification of supply of gas and electricity. A diversified supply structure puts the system in a better position to face threats of energy disruption. The European Union establishes obligations to safeguard security of electricity and gas supply and undertakes significant investment in electricity and gas networks. In the legal context, Two legal acts define the framework for security of supply. These include Directive 89 from 2005 concerning measures to safeguard security of electricity supply and infrastructure investment to ensure the proper functioning of the European internal market for electricity. 
an adequate level of interconnection between member states, an adequate level of generation capacity and balance between supply and demand. The other one, Directive 67 of uh, 2004, concerning measures to safeguard security of natural gas supply in this case. This directive establishes a common framework for member states to define general security of supplies policies that are transparent, non-discriminatory and consistent with the requirements of the desired single market in gas. The other pillar, competitiveness. The European external dependence on energy supplies not only affects to the security of supply itself, but also to the economic competitiveness due to the expected uh, prices increase. The first challenge facing Europe is the need to complete the internal gas and electricity markets. Many national energy markets are still belaguered by protectionism and dominated by a few companies which is bad for consumers because they keep prices high and infrastructure uh, uncompetitive. Opening up these markets will create fair competition between companies at European level and improve the security and competitiveness of the energy supplies in Europe. These monopolies are subject to complex sector specific regulations. The necessary progress to, to, to us, uh, full com implementation of the electricity and gas single market can only be achieved by accompanied by active and effective competition law enforcement. The ultimate goal of competition protection is to guarantee and foster consumers' welfare. This objective coincides with the goal pursued by the regulation. Don't forget that energy is a key input in many production processes. For this reason, its cost represents a competitiveness factor for manufacturing industry with intensity of use to the next to the energy price as the major drivers. Last but not least, we have the sustainability pillar. Energy and environment, as you know, are two closely interlinked matters. Increased worldwide energy consumption and greenhouse gas emission associated are direct causes of global warming and its consequences. The approaches of the Europe, the uh, Europe Union energy policy to this problem are first one, a cleaner energy mix to increase energy efficiency and finally to decouple economic growth from energy consumption. This would be the three pillars of the sustainability in the energy policy. In the context of sustainability and European policy, the Horizon 2020 legislative package born in 2009 represents an integrated approach to climate and energy policy that aims to combat climate change, increase the European energy security and strengthen its competitiveness. The Horizon 2020 defines objectives on renewable energies, emission reduction and energy efficiency. The targets set by the European leaders in March 2007, known as the 2020 targets, set three key objectives for 2020. A 20% reduction in European Union greenhouse emission from the level of uh, 1990. The second one is the rise of the share of European energy consumption produced from renewable resources to 20%. And finally, a 20% of improvement in the European Union energy efficiency. These are the objectives for 2020 and the prospective done in 2009 shows that uh, we are in the way to reach the, the, the reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions. Also, the share of renewables is on the track to be achieved, but there's still uh, um, a additional effort to, to reach the, energy con the reduction in energy consumption by uh, 20%. As you can see, 
is on the way, but not for the energy saving objective. The Climate and Energy Package comprises also four pieces of complementary legislation which are intended to meet these 2020 targets. First, the reform of the European Union Emissions Trading System. This trading system is the key tool for cutting industrial greenhouse gas emissions most cost effectively. You will learn about this in more detail in, in further lessons. Number two, the establishment of national targets for emitting sectors that are not included in the European Emissions Trading System. This means that the member states have taken on binding annual targets for reducing their greenhouse gas emissions from the housing, agriculture, waste and transport sectors. These are the sectors that are not uh, previously included in the emission trading system of Europe. The third one, under the Renewable Energy Directive, member states have taken on binding also national targets for raising the share of renewable energy in their energy consumption by 2020. Finally, the fourth element of the Climate and Energy Package is a directive creating a legal framework for the environmental safe use of carbon capture and storage technologies. And what happens with energy efficiency? There is no, no package regarding this. Well, the, the climate and energy package doesn't address the energy efficiency target directly. This is being done through the 2011 Energy Efficiency Plan and the Energy Efficient Directive. This directive, Directive 27 of 2012, establishes a common framework of measures to ensure the achievement of the 20% target to increase energy efficiency compared to the 2007 reference projections. Measures include, for example, the obligation for like large enterprises to carry out an energy audit at least every four years, also includes the public sectors to, to lead, by example, by renovating 3% of buildings owned and occupied by the central governments by including energy efficiency consideration. Also, for example, the monitoring of efficiency levels of new energy generation capacities. These are just uh, examples of the, uh, the, the measures that are included in this directive. Well, uh, as we've seen, in spite of progress done, significant additional efforts are needed to achieve the 20% energy consumption reduction targets. Most recent projections show that with current policies, the policies uh, that are currently ongoing, we will only achieve a 10% of reduction. The business and usual projector projection from 2007 from the initial situation will have taken us to a situation of increasing energy demand of about 10%. Taking into account the energy efficiency measures that have already been implemented in the member states, a significant reduction is expected of about 10%. However, you can imagine it's not enough to meet the targets in 2020. Additional measures are going to be implemented. It's important to highlight the importance of energy efficiency that drive competitiveness and strengthens security of supply in the European Union in the future. The fact that we are not reaching the desired levels of energy saving, it is not due to a lack of technologies. As can be seen in the figure, high levels of energy efficiency can be achieved in all of the sectors. As usual, technical potential is higher, the blue one, more than 20% of reduction in all of the sectors, except for the industry, it's a bit lower. But as usual, cost-effective measures are not yet uh, in that level. It's just a question of time that both equalize. As you can see, it's an effort of all of the sectors. Well, 
What happens? What will happen after 2020? Well, going beyond 2020, the European Commission has proposed the 2030 Framework for Climate and Energy Policies to make the European Union's economy and energy system more competitive, secure and sustainable. While the European Union is making progress to towards meeting its targets for the 2020, we have uh, already seen it, an integrated policy framework for the period up to 2030 is needed to ensure regulatory certainty for investors. That's important. And a coordinated approach among member states. The proposal presented in January 2014 seeks to drive continued progress towards a low carbon economy. A centerpiece of the framework is the target to reduce European Union domestic greenhouse gas emission by 40% below the 90s level by 2030. We have increased this uh, target for greenhouse gas reduction to 40%. To achieve the overall 40% target, the sectors covered by the European Union emission strategy system, we have already talked about it, we have to reduce their emissions by 43% compared to 2005. Emissions from sectors outside the European Union emission strategy system would need to be cut by 30% below the 2005 level. This effort would be shared equitably between the member states. Also, renewable energy will play a key role in the transitions towards a competitive, secure, and sustainable energy system. The Commission proposed an objective of increasing the share of renewable energy to at least a 27% of the European Union energy consumption by 2003. Lastly, the European Commission has proposed a 30% energy savings target for 2030, following a review of the energy efficiency directive that we have talked about it. One of the global objectives of all this proposal is in fact the effective decoupling of the economy from the greenhouse gas emission. The figure on the left shows the evolution and the apparent decoupling of GDP and greenhouse gas emissions. During periods of uh, experiencing recession, like, like the one we are experimenting in, in Europe, changes in GDP can explain less than a 50% of emission reduction oh, for the European Union as a whole, as the European Environmental Agency states. Other factors and policies have played at least as important role in reducing emissions, including the sustained and strong growth in renewable energy. It's an, an important key factor in the coupling GDP and, and greenhouse gas emission. And also, of course, the improvements in energy efficiency. While GDP has increased 45% since 90s, emissions have fallen 19%. As can be seen in the figure, when talking about greenhouse gas emission reduction, all of the sectors can make an important contribution. Although the energy power sector is the main contributor in red color, it is important to focus also in sectors such as uh, transport or industry, with also uh, important shares. That is the reason why European policy targets all of these sectors. Taking the projection from now and taking into account current policies, the situation in 2020 will be slightly different with a slight uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. The prospection to 2030 is the one which is uh, shown in the, in the figure. With current policies, we will have uh, reached this level, but the new targets in 2030 slow down this, this uh, greenhouse gas emission in all of the sectors. 
Well, now we are going to, to, to do an overview of the electricity, gas and oil market. This might help you to, in further lessons, understand the framework of, uh, of all of these sectors. The member states of the Europe Union have agreed on an ambition plan of building the biggest market of electricity, connecting more than 500 million consumers through the continent. The European Commission seems to be fully committed to fostering this project, the single market for electricity. A well-functioning and competitive market is needed to satisfy the needs and expectations of the European citizens. It will, in addition, contribute to the policy response required to fight climate change and to secure our energy future. As we've seen, the main goal of the European Union policy is the establishment of the energy of the internal electricity market. In July the 2009, the European Parliament and Council adopted a new electricity directive, Directive 72 of 2009, with times at introducing common rules for the generation, transmission, distribution and supply of electricity. It also lays down universal service obligation and consumer rights and clarifies competition requirements. The electricity directive replies the former one, 54 of 2003, that gave the opportunity for consumers to get clear information about the electricity market. It obligated the member states to define the measures about the protection of the consumers and promote the economic and social cohesion. Due to the dysfunction in the internal market in electricity, the European Commission considered it necessary to redefine the rules and measures applied to that market in order to guarantee fair competition and appropriate consumer protection. Another important point focused by this directive is the separation between production supply activities in the network, transmission and distribution. That should be carried out by independent operators of the transmission system. The transmission system operators shall be responsible for the long-term ability of the system to meet reasonable demands for the transmission with due regard to the environment. Let's see a little bit about the gas market. Natural gas, the cleanest fossil fuel, is a vital component of the world energy mix. On a global scale, resources are spread among all continents and remain abundant at the moment. Gas users, present in virtually all sectors of the economy, receive this commodity through an elaborate mix of transport infrastructure, ranging from transnational pipelines to liquefied natural gas vessels and uh, also regasification terminals. The people and companies involved in the gas business within the European Union use a variety of long-term contracts and wholesale trading funds, which uh, are called hubs, to price the gas and to optimize their risk uh, exposure. At a time when European reserves are being depleted and consumer appetite continues to increase, natural gas is becoming critically important to the European Union. Supplying European consumers with gas natural, which is both affordable and reliable, continues to be a major objective for the European Union. Member States and the European Commission consider that the creation of an efficient and well-functioning internal market for gas may be the most potent response for the challenges and uncertainties of tomorrow. A reliable, transparent and interconnected market could address a variety of complex issues, including security of supplies and global warming. The share of gas natural in primary energy consumption has slightly increased to 25% of energy consumption in the European Union. The structure of the gas industry is similar to the oil sector in the production phase and similar to the electricity market in the transportation and distribution market. It is similar also to other competitive commodity markets, 
because prices reflect the ability of supply to meet the demand at uh, any one time. The economics of producing natural gas are relatively straightforward. Like any other commodity, the price of gas natural is largely a function of demand and the supply of the product. When demand for gas is rising and prices rise accordingly, producers will respond by increasing their exploration and production capabilities. As a consequence, production will, over time, tend to increase to match the stronger demand. But the structure of the, gas, of the natural gas industry has changed dramatically since the mid-80s. In the past, the structure of the, gas, of the natural gas industry was simple, with limited flexibility and few options for natural gas delivery. The prices for which producers could sell natural gas to transportation pipeline was regulated, as the price at which pipelines could sell to local distribution companies, which was also regulated. Also, national regulated regulation controlled the price at which local distribution companies could sell natural gas to their customers, so everything was regulated. Thus, the structure of the natural gas industry prior to the regulation was very straightforward and there was little competition in the marketplace. And incentives, uh, to be honest, and incentives to improve services and innovative were few. Nowadays, the natural gas industry has changed dramatically and is much more open to competition and choice. The price of natural gas is dependent on supply and demand interaction, as any other commodity. The international trading of natural gas is subject to the economic and geopolitical scenarios of the planet, in a similar way to oil. For example, Western Europe is highly dependent on this resource, which affects the economic and political relation with the major exporting countries. Well, in the path towards an internal energy market, as we have seen, it's uh, one of the main goals for the European Union energy policies. A progress has already been made. Consumers can now switch suppliers for gas and electricity, and suppliers must provide clear explanation of terms and conditions. But work is still to be done including aligning national market and networks operation roles for gas and electricity, as well as making cross-border investment in energy infrastructure to be easier. In July 2009, the European Parliament and Council adopted a new directive, the Directive 73, which aims at introducing common rules for the transmission, distribution, supply and storage of natural gas. It concerns mainly natural gas, liquefied natural gas, biogas, and gas from biogas, from biomass. Sorry. This directive replaced the directive of 2003, directive number 55, opened up the opportunity for the consumers to get a wide range of information about the gas suppliers to freely choose the best for them from July 2004 and July 2007, respectively. After that, the consumers could know more about the different services qualities, protection of the consumers and the security of the supplies. However, the experiences showed that transparency of the system didn't improve at all. Therefore, the European Commission considered it necessary to redefine the rules and measure up to that market in order to guarantee fair competition and appropriate consumer protection. What happens with the, with the oil market? Well, oil is the world's number one energy source and is expected to remain so in the coming years. Global oil consumption has increased by 20% since 1994 and global oil demand is projected to grow by 1% per year. It is vital to many industry, not only in energy issues, but also for as a raw material for chemical products, pharmaceutical, plastic, fertilizer, etc. 
the world's appetite for oil continues to increase. But a combination of high oil prices, the environmental concerns, the technology advances and other factors points out that oil demand may be going through a process of transformation. An inflection point will likely be reached in the second half of this decade. We will see if that's happening. Oil accounts for a large percentage of the world energy consumption, ranging from a low 30, 32 for Europe and Asia to a high 53% for the Middle East. The production, distribution, refining and retailing of petroleum taken as a whole represent the world's largest industry in terms of value. Among the main actors in the world in the oil sector, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, is particularly noteworthy. It was founded in the 60s by a group of oil producer countries. The OPEC objectives is to coordinate and unify petroleum policies among member countries in order to secure fair and stable prices for petroleum producers. An efficient economic and regular supply of petroleum to consuming nation and a fair return on capital to those investing in the countries. Currently, OPEC controls around 43% of worldwide production and the 75% of oil service, reserves. It has therefore a, a great influence in the, in the oil market, as you can imagine. Also, talking about uh, important actors in the oil market, the International Energy Agency plays also an important role in the energy market. It was founded in the 1974 due to the global oil crisis and its initial role was to help countries to coordinate a collective response to major disruption in oil supplies through the release of emergency uh, oil stocks. Currently, the International Energy Agency is an autonomous organization which works to ensure reliable, affordable and clean energy for, this, for its 29 members, you can see in the border of the slide, and beyond. The International Energy Agency four main areas of focus are, first of all, energy security, promoting diversity, efficiency and flexibility within all energy sectors, economic development, ensuring the stable supply of energy to international energy agency member countries and promoting free markets to foster economic growth and eliminate energy poverty. The third, environmental awareness, enhancing international knowledge of options too for tackling climate change. And finally, the engagement worldwide working closely with non-member countries, especially major producers and consumers, to find solutions to share energy and environmental concerns. Unlike the other sectors, uh, international oil market operation doesn't permit its regulation from uh, European community law as other energy sectors. By means of Directive 119 of uh, 14 September 2009, the European Commission coordinates the maintenance of emergency stocks of crude oil and petroleum products. In doing so, it pursues five major objectives. First of all, increase the security of supply for crude oil and petroleum products by establishing and maintaining minimum stocks. The second one is to promote solidarity between the member states in the event of an energy crisis by putting in place predefined measures and mechanisms which will warrant coordinated action. Third one is to manage security of supplies by providing for sustainable mechanisms to deal with physical disruption of energy supplies. 
the, to promote a market stability together with producer countries by planning possible responses to situations where the market anticipate uh, a disruption of supplies in order to restore the proper functionality, uh, functionality of the market and finally uh, increase the transparency in oil market. European Commission can act to this point but no uh, with further regulations. Finally, uh, we can see um, an overview of the carbon market. This will be uh, seen in further detail in, in other lessons, but uh, to have a, a, a brief overview, the European Union emission trading system is a cornerstone of the European Union's policy to combat climate change and its key tool for reducing industrial greenhouse gas emission costs efficiently. The first, and still by far the biggest, international system for trading greenhouse gas emission allowances, the European Union emission trading system covers more than 11,000 power stations and industrial plants in 31 countries. The European Union emission trading schemes works on the cap and trade principle. A cap or limit is set on the total amount of certain greenhouse gases that can be emitted by the factories, power pines, and other installations in the system. The cap is reduced over time, so the total emission falls. Within the cap, companies receive or buy emission allowances, with they, which they can trade with one another as needed. In 2020, emissions from sectors covered by the European Union emission trading schemes will be 21% lower than in 2005. By 2030, the Commission proposes that this should be 43% lower. So this is uh, the overview of the energy markets in the, in the European Union that uh, will help you to understand the next 